Okay, now that we're recording, hello and welcome. We're going to do a scale form from scratch in one hour. First things first, uh, we're going to take a look at our data folder. And here everything is pretty clean. This is the interface folder. This is where we're going to put the scale form source files. Set up uh, similar to how the script folder is set up with the compiled stuff going right on the root and source files in the source folder. This is where we'll make a new import and create some papyrus scripts later on. So I guess let's just go ahead and get started with a brand new menu and Adobe Flash. Flash. Alright, here we are with Flash. Let's make a new file. I'm going to choose the Action Script 3.0 for Fallout 4. Skyrim uses 2.0, but we're using 3.0 here. Uh, these files are probably, or settings are probably all fine. Um, I like to change the background color. That uh, has no effect in game. This is just the uh, editor background for your file. Right, let's go ahead and save the files. And I'm gonna start with a new import for my project. This folder here will be for all of the uh, interface files related to what we're building right now. Let's name the file something like scribe menu. See why are we having trouble here? That was weird. Looks like I saved to the wrong folder. And let's just restart Adobe Flash. Okie dokie now. Alright, here's Adobe Flash. First things first, let's get a document class onto the menu. And this will be the code that controls everything, all the shapes and text and whatnots on the uh, stage here. Uh, might as well just call it the same thing as the FLA file. And this will make a new class. One moment I look at my notes. All 
Alright, so here's that new document class we made. It is an extends type movie clip, which is what the whole menu is. The whole menu is a movie clip, and we've gone and attached it to the root of it. And here it is, the class name. And I prefer to edit the source code, not in Flash. Okay, now that this is here, this does nothing, but it's uh, primed and ready for us to add some code in a moment. All right, let's get some interesting things for the menu. Um, say a couple text fields and a rectangle shape. Go ahead and uh, make a folder to hold all my new library objects in. Make a new symbol. And we'll call this, what did I call this in my notes? Right, I call it the info panel. All right, now when you make a new shape, it automatically puts you inside of that shape. So as you draw, you're drawing inside of the shape. I guess let's uh, make some text boxes. This looks good for now. And let's make three text boxes. Make this 200 wide. All right, so that's three three text boxes here. The plan is that I'm going to um, read the data off of some form object in Papyrus and then send that information to the user interface to be displayed. So we'll display the name of the item, the description of it, and what it's worth in caps. Okay, now we need to give these text boxes instance names. Kind of like uh, when you drag a new item from the object view into the render window, you need to give it a reference name to use it in scripts. Uh, these text boxes work in a similar way. What to call this? Um... All right. 
right, item name, description, and cost. Now for a background. Add a new layer. Get the shape tool. All right, uh, good enough. Now, one thing about uh, text is that this will go ahead and display as is in game. But if you ever try to set it dynamically, then it won't recognize the um, font characters. So you have to embed the font you're using inside of your Swift file or load it in uh, through runtime sharing from the font lib that's provided by Fallout or one of your own making. Uh, I won't cover that, so we'll just uh, embed the font directly into the menu. I uh, right click, make new font. And um, slate mobile. All right, um, now one thing about this, we've gone ahead and defined the font we want to use, but we also have to say what characters from this font set we want to actually import. If you leave these all unchecked, then it'll just look like a bunch of scrambled characters in game. So import them all. All right, I think this is pretty good. Now that we have designed an info panel, we can add it to the actual stage here. Now this is kind of like the creation kit um, object window where you have objects, you can drag them onto the render window. This is kind of like that where you can make multiple instances of an object that you make. Now that I put it in here, I'm going to give this an instance name too. And now let's look at publish settings. I did a control shift F12 and that pulls up the publish settings or you can get to that through the file menu here. Uh, we don't need HTML wrappers. All we need is this flash and everything else. Oh yeah, set the output to the interface folder. And that's where the game can find it. Here it is warning me about fonts. All right, so what happened when I first made these text fields, I set them to use a not embedded font. Now that I have the Slate Mobile embedded, I need to tell my text boxes to actually use that. I did a multi-select and your your fonts that you have embedded or imported away will have an asterisk next to them in this uh, list.
and there it is. I just did Alt Shift F12 and that just tells it to uh, publish straight away without uh, pulling up the dialog for it like this. Alright, before the internet went off, we had just finished making the scale form menu. Now we're going to move over and hook it up to Papyrus so we can get this shown in game. Alright, I'm going to make a new import folder for my new scripts. Make a new namespace folder. And I'm going to cheat and just copy a couple files. Get my scripts. All right, first things first. I like to set up a Papyrus project that says what imports I'm using. I have uh, my F4C scripts installed here instead of into the user folder. I have put them all into an F4C folder. And there they are. So I'm telling my Papyrus project file that I want to import these scripts by going up one directory and then grabbing the F4C scripts. Also grab the base scripts. This is telling it to import itself, so it'll import scribe guide too. So once you have a Papyrus project set up, you can copy the file path to the PPJ. Open a new terminal in the Papyrus compiler folder. And just give the Papyrus compiler the full path to that PPJ and it should be compiling for you. And there it is, all three of my scripts were built. But uh, let's walk through these scripts and see what the heck is going on here. All right, first things first. We got this um, scribe type class that I make. It's a native constant class. And it's a class that I use for other classes to extend. It has uh, common data such as I provide a reload event for the uh, whenever the player reloads a game save this event will occur and uh, let me uh, run some maintenance code. This will be the event that I send from ActionScript to Papyrus later on and this is what I'll initially be sending to ActionScript to begin with. So on the base type that the other scripts will extend, I start by writing out this maintenance code, providing an item struct. All right. Now I make a new script. It's called scribe menu. It extends this base type that I just wrote. 
and what it does is exposes the properties and methods of the menu we just wrote. First thing um, that happens in the script is initialization. So I, on quest initialize, register for a game reload. In the game reload, <clears throat> I create a new structure for menu data, set the flags, and then register my new custom menu with a name, a path, and a route. These methods will control certain aspects like opening, closing, toggling, and setting data. And the properties at the end are just basic properties that um, have information about the menu, like is it open, close, register or not, what its name is. And then lastly, we'll have this data controller class. It has a property to the menu that we were just looking at, and it's going to call functions on that menu, passing that data in from type. All right, now that I gave a good overview of everything, I'm going to delete it all and write it all out. All right, so um, where we had left off before, we have a flash menu already made, and now we're going to write a backing Papyrus class for it so that we can uh, use Papyrus to talk to that menu. Um, I'm going to start with a couple common properties to menus, and um, I guess we'll start going, and um, I'll explain what I'm doing as I go. To make a property group to hold all my properties. And now I'm going to make a property for the menu's name. It's going to be a full property with a getter uh, only. So it'll be essentially read only. All right, the name of the menu is Scribe Menu. Another parameter that is common to menus is the file path. And we'll specify that here. The file path is rooted to the data interface folder, and it is the file name without the extension. So it's the same as the name in this case. I'll do the same thing and make a read-only property. Alright, we have a menu name and a menu path. Now there is a, another property called root, and this is going to be the same for every menu, 
and it's the first variable in a variable path you use to invoke members of your action script classes. And we'll do that in like the third half of this little segment. So I'll just go ahead and make another read-only property for that. I'm just going to copy one of the other ones to save some time. And it is always root 1. All right, another thing we might want to know about the menu is if it's registered or not, so that if it's already registered on game reload, we can just not re-register it. And we're going to make a Boolean property for that. Same thing, it's going to be read-only, but instead of returning it literal, it's going to return the result of a function call. Don't need that setter. And we're going to say that is registered the Boolean, it means is UI is menu registered. And it's going to be this menu. And UI is menu registered is a XSC UI papyrus call. And here you can see them in the F4C UI base script. Has some uh, good notes in here. But we'll be using this function to make our Boolean. takes one string parameter, the name of your menu, so I'll just go and give it the name here. So now we can call scribe menu dot is registered and it'll say true or false without having to call it like this. And the last one we're going to need is one for is open. And it's going to be just like this with the UI is open call. So it's asking, is scribe menu open? Yes or no? These here are some magical sort of constant values that I figured out from looking at XSC source code. Um, they're read-only. There are some flags that I can use to set options on the menu when I go ahead and register it. Um, not much to say about this. Maybe I'll cover these more later. But for now, you'll just see how I use them. <clears throat> All right, so I'm going to make a onQuest init, and then I'm going to use this maintenance code here to register for an on-game reload event that I made. And on that event here, I'm going to red check if the menu is registered on every game reload, and then do so if it's not.
I'm going to call the register for reload and then pass uh, self into it. And it's going to register the remote player event for this script. So now self here is registered for this event, which I'm going to override. Now, on player load game only happens not the first time the player loads the game, but every time after that. On quest, on quest in it only happens it happens when the quest first starts, and game reload doesn't happen then. So I want to call game reload the first time. So then when the event actually happens every subsequent reload it'll uh, be called every single time the first and every after okay so now for the registering first thing I want to do is check if my menu is already registered not then register it. So if we are not registered, create some new menu data and register it. The um, F4C UI base script provides a structure. And this is the initial data that the menu sort of starts with. It's like the, the initial settings here. Um, they have default values, but the two flags that I chose are the ones I'm going to use. Um, I'm not going to use any mini flag, so I'm going to use the none flag. Which you could also just write like this. And actually, no, extended flags, that is, um, flag do not prevent game save. Okay, no extended flags and the do not prevent game save when this menu opens. Usually, by default, you can't save the game while you're in certain menus, and this tells it to not do that. First thing we want to give it is the name, and then the path, the root, and then this data structure of settings we just made. Okie dokie. Now every time the game reloads, if the menu is not registered, then it will be.
Now, registering doesn't open the menu, but it does put it into the normal event system, like um, the vanilla uh, on open close menu event. That'll be um, available for registering now. Um, but before we can get to the event for open and close, we need some methods to actually do the opening and closing. So I'll make an open and a close method. Hmm. All right. So first, to open the menu, we want to check if the menu is already open or not. And if the menu is not open, check if it's registered. And if it is, then open it. Is open is the same property we defined down here, which just checks if the name of this menu is open. Alright, a little warning there so we know why it didn't work when it doesn't work. Return true because I'm, I'm going to return success rather than completion. Um, if the menu is already open, then I'm going to say that was a success because... All that means is that it didn't have to do any work. But it's not necessarily a failure, so I'll return true for if it's already open. Okay, but if it's not already opened, then now we have to do some work. Check if it's registered first. And uh, if it is registered, then, then open it. But what if it's not registered? Oh, um, UI open menu. returns a boolean and it does not indicate if the menu is ready only that the, it was requested and that's what I'm going to return for success or not in the case that I call open so there it is returning the result of opening so if it's not registered Uh, return failure.
All right. Do I return a bool on every branch? Looks like I do. All right. Now I need a way to close this thing. Hmm. All right, it's almost the same thing, except I just check if it's the other way around. So I'll just copy all this and do a little logic change. If it is not open, then it is already closed. And if it is not open, and it is registered, then close it. And if it is not registered, then it is not registered. Return false. True. All right, I think that is enough to see if this works in game. Now to compile this thing. And success. Let's hook it up to the CK. All right, I've already gone ahead and got a master loaded up, and I'm going to save the file. Um, I already went ahead and mastered it, so we didn't have to sit here watching the CK load. And this is a totally clean plugin. I'll show you the data details. Nothing here. Um, the only record at all in this whole plugin we should need is a new quest. All right, for the quest, um, you shouldn't have to change any settings at all. Just make a new one, close it, open it, and attach the scripts. All right, that should be it. Um, this should work in game now. So I'm going to switch the screen over to my main monitor and... Let's see what happens. Oh no, the most important. I forgot to activate the plugin. Okay, 
now we can go. Uh, right here from the main menu, I'm just going to go to an exterior cell, uh, the red rocket. Oh, hey, Divine. CK loading. Hey, look, there's the minium. There it is. And look, no airs of mine. So that's pretty cool. Hey, Brandon. Alrighty. So this doesn't do anything cool. We probably want to like stick some game data in here. So if you bear with me a moment, let me get some files in order and then I'll show you how to do that. I'm gonna switch the screen again. Let's get my code. Don't need this. 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 Or this. All right, there's the class, uh, scribe menu, the document class for the scale form menu. And here it is attached right to the menu. Before I'd shown that um, all the objects on the stage have an instance name. In this case, each text box has a name. Item cost, description, and a name. And in the info panel, it's called info. So you can think if there's sort of a file path going on, if you wanted to think of it like that, but it's more of a variable path. So I would call root dot one dot info dot item description dot text equals whatever I want it to be and that's sort of the short version of it so we need to on the document class make a function that the papyrus can call onto this menu to set these fields here and we'll do that here uh, let me get a, another file it on the side. Whew, all right, action script. Uh, action script is usually uh, not a whole lot of fun to work with for Fallout 4, but uh, here we go. Um, so on the stage here, we have the info panel. We want to get a property just like you would in a script with an auto property. We basically need to make a property to this info instance here. 
uh, it's of type movie clip so we'd make a movie clip property and call it info and it'll essentially like autofill we'll make this public I I'm pretty sure it has to be public if it's um, a public stage instance that you're using just like um, the papyrus properties have to be they're basically public and that's the movie info clip now movie clips have events just like uh, papyrus scripts kind of do um, in this case, these have an on added to stage event and an on removed from stage. Um, for some some code actions, you don't want to do it in the constructor because the menu itself might not actually be like uh, completely fully loaded um, at this point in time. So you want to wait until after your stage, after your movie has been added to the stage, to run certain code. So in your constructor is where I would register for those events. Oops, we're about to use an event, so I have to um, import the uh, flash events. And this is the namespace, flash events, and this is the type. And I'm about to use an event type. Which has a constant on it for the event name that I want to uh, listen to. and also one for removed line endings in action script Now these are callbacks. You're saying you want to listen for the added to stage event on this object. And you want to receive this event on this function. Um, it's not defined yet, so I have to do that so that I can receive these functions that I'm listening for. I just cheated, but that's what the um, handlers look like. All right, before we go any further, one good thing to have is a reusable library that you can use from project to project. I've uh, spent a lot of time doing action script projects and so with every project I take the most reusable parts and I sort of fold them into an ongoing library so that every time I start a new project um, I can get up and going faster and faster with every time that I grow the library. So um, I would recommend either using somebody else's library, start building your own, or um, download one like a third party one which you can also do. Um, lots of people use tween libraries and stuff. Um, 
I'm going to go ahead and import into my project an ActionScript library that I reuse all the time. Um, I'm going to import it into my um, Flash movie and then use the stuff in the library here. So we'll take a moment to set up the imports for that. All right, I've just copied my uh, reusable library and I'm going to put it into my scribe guide files. Actually, no, I'm going to put it next to my scribe guide files because it's a separate library. This is mine and uh, this is the reusable. With the files there, now I have to import them into my ActionScript settings. So I just tell it where the folder is. I'm looking for that follow library folder. And it's relative to the movie clip you're importing to. So in my case, I go one directory up, and then I enter it here. So add a new path, go up one directory, and then enter the fallout root, uh, the fallout library directory root. And that's all I need. Um, probably a good idea to turn off automatically declare stage instances. I'm not sure that does other than cause problems. Okay, now I can use um, some handy dandy functions that I've written for ActiScript. So one of the things I wrote is a nice um, formatted logging class so that I can put stuff into the F4C log and it's all labeled up and looks nice. So I'm going to go ahead and import those classes that I have. That would be the diagnostics debug and uh, utility classes that I wrote. Uh, each one only has like two functions. This one will trace out an object and this one will trace out a display list for a movie clip. My debug just writes a log line to a log file. And uh, yeah. So I'm going to use that logging function to just log um, when it's added to stage and when it's removed. I follow a sort of uh, naming scheme so I can tell what's going on in my logs. And that's the class name, function name, and then the message.
what I'm doing with these utility functions is when it's added to the stage, I'm going to dump a whole bunch of diagnostics information. And um, we'll take a look at that in the logs when we get there. I'm going to dump the object, and then I'm going to dump the display list. Just going to write a message for this one. All right, so that covers some basic setting up a library, getting some basic diagnostics, default events for movie clips. Um, now for something special with one of the versions of XSC, they um, added a code object interface to custom menus. Whenever you register a custom menu, it'll inject a sort of code object into the root of your menu that you can access. Um, to receive that object, you can use an event. So um, I already implemented an interface in my code library. It doesn't require an interface, but it helps me on the compiler and tell me when I spell it wrong or something. But you implement a function like named this that takes just a code object of unspecified type and that'll be the F4C code object. So if I implement this event on my class, then I'll get the, the XSC going on. So I'm going to say that I implement the class like an interface. And now if I compiled it, it should actually complain that it's missing the interface. Yeah, wah, code object uh, interface was not found. And there it is, I just implemented it. Okay, so this is the XSC code object you're going to be receiving from um, XSC. And for my library to work, it's going to want to store a copy of that because if I don't store this object now, then when this function returns, then this this is uh, no longer around, so I want to store this somewhere I can use it again. And um, let me show you where. I just have a global static that I'm going to set this to. And then I can just call extensions API and get a reference to the API. I'm going to trace this code object so I can show you that you can almost use a sort of reflection on objects in ActionScript to generate a list of all the members that it has. Gotta remember 
of those line endings. All right, and I'm going to trace that object when I get it. All right, I think that this mini was ready for a function to receive data. Um, before I do that, I'm going to define the data in Papyrus first and then come back and add that last function for getting that data. And here it is. Um, I already went ahead and made this uh, structure here. I'm going to instantiate a new structure, um, populate it with some data, and then send it on to the menu. And it's going to get this structure and have a string name, description, the cost, and I'll even show that you can read some uh, form data in ActionScript. So with that, Let's add a function on the Papyrus menu. Do, do, do. Okay, so here we go. We're going to make a set data function to send data to scale form. Make myself a new little code region. Okay, so item is this structure here. This is scribe type. And this menu extends that. So it inherits this class here. So I don't have to do... You would have to write that to use the structure just like that if it was another class, but because I'm inheriting, you don't have to input yourself. All right, for sending the data, the menu can't be closed. It can't receive, min or, uh, can't receive data if it's not there to receive it. So we gotta check if the Mini was open, and if the value that we're sending is even valid. So that, that's about two conditions there. All right, if we are open, we're not open, then say so, but if we are open, check that value isn't just null or none. And uh, if it's not, then send it.
little error message. Okay, so we'll be using UI Invoke from XSE. It takes the menu name, and then it needs that variable path that we talked about here, which is info root one dot info dot the text field name. Go ahead and pull that up. So here it is. So it takes the menu name, the variable path to the function that you want to invoke, and then an array of arguments. They're not typed. So you can send any combination of arguments. So I'm going to take my structure and wrap it inside of a var array and then send it in. Um, there's only one argument here, which is the item struct, so it's going to be array length of one. And then go ahead and smush that item value into the first element. All right, what did I do wrong? Uh, var array of arguments equals new var array. Smelling. And then, all right, invoke that. On the menu, I have yet to put the function that we'll be invoking. It'll be called set data when I get to it. And also, I'm going to make a little helper function to help uh, concat the string variable path to the members. This function will be, you can ask it for say the name of a public function like that would be how you would invoke on the root 
which is the scribe menu on the root, you would in invoke the root member name if it's public. All right, so where are we? So we're sending the data wrapped in the arguments and we're making a get member helper function which will concat the root to the member variable path. All right, I like that better. So I can just say, hey, uh, get the get the menu member called set data. Send it these arguments. And now to make the set data function on the menu. Now we're going to we're going to need a way to decode that structure in ActionScript. And the best way to start with handling it is just to keep its type generic and don't try to make it concrete at first. So um, I'm going to make the receiving function just uh, accept an object. Alright, if the object is, if the argument object is not null, then we're going to trace it. Okay, so now when we receive the structure we sent from Pyrus to the menu, it'll come in as a non-concrete object type. If it's not null, then we're going to trace the object, which will spit out all of the uh, properties and uh, functions and whatnots on it. And then, um, yeah, I think we'll just start with that. So I'm going to rebuild the papyrus and the action script and then run this in game. Actually, um, geez, I'm getting a little ahead of myself. I need something to call the said data on papyrus. So um, 
now that we have the set data set up here, when it gets data, it's just going to trace the data out and not do anything with it yet. All right, so instead of um, putting all this data inside of the existing menu, we're going to make a separate controller class that will control the menu so that the menu stays um, more or less stateless and doesn't have any data inside of it. It's just something that's called upon. So I'll make another class that actually will populate the data, hold on to the data, and be in charge of sending and stuff. So first thing I'm going to do is set up some properties to some, some armor piece. I'm going to populate a structure, um, register for a key press, and then send the data via the menu papyrus. So here we go. I'm going to use the uh, T-51 helmet. And now we need a property to the menu class that we already wrote. So that I have a property to it here, I can call the uh, functions on it. And instead of armor, the type is the script type it is. And uh, we need a property for the uh, key press key that we want to press. That's a constant. You can look up the DirectX scan codes. And this is the letter P, value 80. All right, now to make a uh, reload event and then populate the data structure. This is the structure we'll be making. It also inherits from type, so we don't have to import. Actually, I'm going to make an instance on the class level.
All right, for the last property, I'm going to just store the whole form in there just so that um, I can trace some form data out in ActionScript and you can just see how that works. Now to register for the key press that I'm going to use to open and close the menu. register for the menu. Like I said, um, when you register this way, you can use the vanilla event system for menus. Now, one thing about registering for menus that a lot of people forget is um, you want to doubly make sure that if the council menu is open, you are not listening to the key presses. So that's one thing I always build into my key press events is to just don't don't handle key presses if the council menu is open because likely you are using the council and not intending for gameplay key press stuff to happen. So I'll uh, just make it short circuit if uh, it detects that. And short circuit. All right, so so if the menu is open, then exit. But if the council is not open, then we're good. So let's open the menu with the key down press. Now we want to get this data into the menu with the set data um, function, but it has an is open condition, so we can't we can't send data until the menu is already opened. Um, we don't want to do that right after the open call because we can't guarantee that it is actually open after the call straight away. So instead, we want to register for the menu open event and then handle that instead of just calling it right after here. And we already register it, so we just have to uh, implement. and opening okay if the menu is opening then send the data on in But one thing here is that this menu only opens once. So I press the key down, the menu opens, 
but then it just stays open. There's like never a way to close it. And I think I just want to set up a toggle so that I can press the P key, it opens, press it again, it closes, and so on. So I'll just make a toggle function that uses open and close. Ha, huh, I cheated on that one. Uh, what it does is checks, okay, if the menu is open, then close it. Else, something went wrong. If it was open and failed to close. And then you just flip the conditions the other way. If the menu is open, then return true. So yeah, this is just reporting here. So instead of just calling open, we're going to call toggle instead. All right, back to the action script. So now this will actually get that data whenever I press a key P and the menu opens. But now we need to get some way to get the uh, information out of this structure argument and into the info text fields. But it's kind of mysterious, so let's trace the object out and then see what we can do. I'm going to recompile everything and run the game. Oh, I'm missing an import here. And fix. Recompiling. Now I got to go in the creation kit and fill out those new properties and attach that new data class. This is a property to this class. So it's taking the quest object it's on to find it. There shouldn't be any properties here, it's pretty stateless. Alright, I'm going to switch over to my primary monitor. And here we go. I haven't looked at the chat in a long time. dog meat. Alright, if I press this P key, there it is, look at that toggling on and off just like it should. 
Never mind my stack airs. That's pretty neat, isn't it? So like I was saying, how do we get that structure data from from just that generic object argument? Well, I have a utility function to trace it out. So let's start there. Now when I press the P key, you'll see it trace everything from those utility functions. And here it is, tracing out all this tasty information. Here's the structure that I was receiving. It says um, from the set data function call, tracing arguments from the object. And here it is. It says that it's a struct with these underscores of type object. And then it has a data inside of it. And look at that. Name, T51 helmet. Description, T51 helmet armor. And there's the game data with the handle high and low of type armor, cost 80. So all this information I was able to send into scale form. Now we just gotta hook it up into the uh, text boxes. Now another really neat thing about doing scale form is that you don't have to close the game to change stuff. You can leave it running while you work and recompile stuff most of the time. I gotta rearrange these screens so we can see two things at once. All right, so here we are, set the tracing the argument. And this is what it is. So how do we access that and get it into like a usable variable? Well, you just use, um, use an indexer, but instead of using a number for the index, you can use a, a string value. Um, I won't get into all that crazy weird action script stuff. Just uh, note what I do when I write it. Okay, so first thing I'm going to do is set that info item name. I'm going to grab the name T51 Helmet out of the structured data. Underscore, underscore, struct, underscore, underscore. And then within the structure, because it's nested, do another indexer. And then finally, use the name of the uh, variable.
Okay, so our item name text box should be filled with the structure data name. The game's running and I can just recompile this right now. Oh no, it screwed up for some reason. Something with the font. But it looks like it is working. Let's keep going. Cost description. Put them into the text fields. Just double check, I did my font right. Ah, yep. I was showing you guys how not to do it, and then I, I did it the way you shouldn't do it. So you uh, import all the character rings. So crazy it might work. Oh yeah, it does. So, uh, look at that, tracing data. So uh, there, I hope you guys like that. I'm going to run another one of these tomorrow, and hopefully it'll like be not as rough around the edges. But this was me sort of feeling out like how, how this whole thing is going to go. So um, I'm going to turn the mic off and then jump over to the chat and see if you guys liked that or not.